G'day guys. People keep asking me to cover off on the Gloom Spite Gits, both through Facebook and through YouTube. I'm not sure if it's the same people, just asking over and over again, but I've noticed it quite a lot, so I'm going to do that today. Now, I've got two different approaches I can take with this video. The path of least resistance is just talking directly about the models, what I do and don't like. And to some degree, I will do that in the episode, because, well, It'd be mislabeling things to talk, call it Gloom Spike Gits or something. I haven't decided on the title at the time of recording and then not talk about them. So I won't do that. What I want to do instead is to use them as an example along with some other factions about where I see Age of Sigma going. What you can pretty much expect as the range goes on. Talk about how we got to this point and some trends I've been noticing. Now... This is going to allow me to make a few predictions on upcoming factions and such, and it'll either turn out that I'm brilliant at reading the future, Games Workshop's very predictable, or I'm completely wrong and a dumbass. Any of those could apply, we're yet to see which. So, what I want to do is look at these other factions and point out the trends I've been noticing, and then we'll finish off by talking about the Gloom Spike gets themselves and what I do and don't like there. So, to start off with, Games Workshop had a lawsuit a couple of years back against a company called Chapter House Studios. Most people are familiar with it, but the quick rundown is, this company was being very blatant about making upgrade kits, conversion accessories for Games Workshop models. Now, Games Workshop didn't take too kindly to this and tried to sue the pants off them. The problem is, when it went to court, Games Workshop mostly lost on the lawsuit. Now, keep in mind, this isn't a single lawsuit. This isn't your judge duty um, where you go on there and I, they copied one of my models and you get a payout. You have to prove different intent. And you have to show what they did and how you tried to stop them doing it over a whole different range of products. And the problem was Games Workshop couldn't really do that very well because the things Games Workshop thought they owned were words that were in common usage and common parlance. For example, pauldrons. Pauldrons are the shoulder plates on armour. Everyone knows marines have massive pauldrons. Well, Games Workshop thought they owned the copyright to pauldrons. The problem is, they've been on armour since humans have basically worn shoulder armour. It's their name. Um, they try to do the same thing with halberds. Halberds are a type of pole arm. Uh, the name Halberd's at least six to seven hundred years old. So again, you can't really copyright that. It's like trying to copyright the word sword or axe. Doesn't work too well. So, Games Workshop tried this sort of thing, failed abysmally, and they walked away from this judgement with a couple of options. The first was, hmm, alright, how's about we just not be dicks to the aftermarket, they want to make stuff that enhances our minis. Hey, people are going to have to come buy our miniatures anyway and convert them with this stuff. So, you know what? We're selling models and we make huge profit anyway. So, who cares? That's the path that most companies take. You don't see Cromwell or Anvil Industries, you know, or Mantic War Games out there suing the pants off everyone who makes miniatures that are compatible with their own. It doesn't happen. Because mostly people don't give a shit. But Games Workshop's the exception. They are very litigious. So, the next option they have is, alright, one of the things we tried to sue them for was names for miniatures, and those miniatures don't exist. And they failed at that. Basically, you can't copyright something that doesn't exist yet in physical form. And I mean, I'm grossly simplifying the judgement when I say this, but it meant if they didn't have a model for something like a Tyranid Spore, um, then Games Workshop just pulled it from production. Or pulled, sorry, I shouldn't say from production because it was never in production. They pulled it out of the codex. No longer exists. So all those different special characters, you know, like the Dark Eldar copped a punishing from this lawsuit because when the Dark Eldar got their new 40k codex, it had been gutted of special characters because they didn't have models. And Games Workshop wasn't about to go and do all that hard work and create models. Oh no, we don't do hard work, we do easy profits. Uh, some people are judging me for saying this right now, but it, you can see the evidence for yourself, it's true. It's not wrong of them to do. Every company wants to do the least amount of work to make the most profit. 
you know, I'm not judging them on that. It's just a Games Workshop's MO. So, they would then come along later on and make their own new versions, but with copyright-friendly names, which is the third thing, which was if you want to make something and call it something specific, you need to give it a name that's unique. And so Games Workshop went with the latter two options, which was pull shit that you don't actually make out of the books, so that way other companies can't make their own Tyranid spores and things like that. So cool, they solved that problem, and of course, copyright the names, which is why you saw things all of a sudden go from being Imperial Guard to Astra Militarum, Sisters of Battle to Adeptus Sororitus. Now, they always did have the name Adeptus Sororitus in the background fluff, but nobody used it. It wasn't even what they put on the official Games Workshop web store. They always just put Sisters of Battle. But that couldn't stand after the Chapter House lawsuit. Now, to be fair to Games Workshop, this is partly because you have to try and enforce your copyright. If you don't take steps to actively protect it, it's considered in court that you don't care about it therefore it's null and void. Copyright law is pretty fucked, globally. Now, this brings us to Age of Sigma. When Age of Sigma was released, they brought out new factions, and they squatted or deleted a bunch of old factions, or they changed them, facelifted them radically. Now, some people argue, oh yeah, you know, certain factions are still there, like you can still buy um, the old school orcs, or the old school dwarves, or the old school empire. It's like, well, no, you can only buy some of the kits, because a lot of them just went out of production outright, and you're not getting any ongoing support. Like, if you think you're going to get um, constant updates and re-releases for Bretonia, you're dreaming. Yeah, they might look at Bretonia again down the line, but it will not be the Bretonia you know and love. It will be a completely different entity. Same with the Tomb Kings. If they cover the Tomb Kings again, well, I'll make some predictions about that sort of thing later on. So, Games Workshop now has two choices of what to do with each of their factions. I know I'm saying they have a lot of choices, but they do as a company. Do you A, keep going with the existing themes, but try and make it more copyright friendly, or B, you try and significantly shift the focus of a faction, therefore causing people to have to buy new models in order to fit into your new game system. Well, they went with the latter, which is basically out with the old, in with the new. Again, least amount of work, most amount of profit. It's easier to bring out new army books and five or six new units, call it a new faction, get rid of the old ones, say to people, hey, you still want to play? You need to buy this. Is what it is. So, that was the step they took. And when they make those new factions, they again have two choices. Do they A, carry over existing aspects and dial them up to 11 and try and make that one certain little sub-portion of a faction into a whole entity? Or do they B, try and take something that exists in a faction and then go, how can we theme a whole army around it and create something unique out of it? Now, these two different approaches are exemplified by things like the Fire Slayers and the Caradon Overlords, which will be my first two examples. So with the Fire Slayers, they took Dwarf Slayers, an existing unit from the Dwarf Faction, and they said, all right, what are Dwarf Slayers? Well, they've got a bit of a thing with death, you know, they want to reclaim some lost honor, die honorably in battle, you know, good stuff. Uh, well, they're pretty much naked warriors, so let's go right with that thing. Let's just give them, like, little leather G-strings, and we'll let the beard cover the rest. Oh, okay, okay, that sounds good. What else? Oh, well, we can't let them have armor, because they want to die. But we'll give them helmets, and we'll put massive, like, crests on the top of the helmets, with, like, dragon's faces and bronze, and, you know, it'll look really cool offset against, like, these big flaming mohawks. Yeah, yeah, that sounds cool. What about weapons? Oh, well, you know, they're armed with axes. But they can't just be any old axes now, because we've got to dial it up to 11. So they've got to be gigantic axes, and they've got to, you know, they've got to be double-headed axes, or they've got to be really ornate axes, and the axes themselves have to have axe heads the size of the model's torso. So, this first instance, they take the existing faction, and they dial everything up about a particular unit to 11. 
The second option was taking existing concepts and going, oh, yeah, you know, there's a bit of steampunky vibe there, gyrocopters, you know, why don't we make those into a faction? We could have gyrocopters. Well, who, who's in them? Well, we could maybe go full steampunk. We could have iron breakers, iron breakers in helicopters. Well, we don't want to go helicopters. We need to be more copyright friendly. What about high fantasy? Hmm, I don't know. What about steampunk? Ah, now we're talking. We've got this sort of Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea style. Um, and it meets these weird ships. And, of course, we get these models. The same sort of thing happened with other factions. With the Adonith Deepkin. Yeah, you took elves and elves needing to reclaim souls and that sort of mentality. And the fact, oh yeah, you know, there's high elf sea guard and there's dark elf corsairs. You know, maybe we can do something with the ocean. What about an ocean themed force? Yeah, that sounds pretty neat. So they take that little kernel that's there, that existing little bit in the, in the corners of the backstory of these main factions, and they flesh it into something new. They do the same thing again with the Daughters of Cain, but this is more like the Fire Slayers. They take those existing units, in this case we have the Doomfire Warlocks, I believe, and the uh, Witch Elves, slash Sisters of Slaughter. They all carried over from the existing Dark Elf range, uh, as well as the Cauldron of Blood and Blood Rat Shrine. So they take these existing things, they port them over, and they go, alright, we know we've got existing Witch Elves, so we can make a faction cheaper this way. We just use a couple of existing kits. We've got three existing kits. What are we going to do? Well, we'll give them a character. Right, cool. Uh, some of our kits have multiple builds. That's going to make the range look even bigger than it is. Because, I mean, if you took Games Workshop's web store and took out all the duplicates, like... Alright, Witch Elves would be one option. Sists of Slaughter would roll into that. The Cauldron of Blood would be one option. Both the other Cauldron variants would roll into that. All of a sudden, it's gone from six kits to three. It's... Yeah. <laughs> um, so they went, okay, what are our options here? Well, we got this really cool sort of uh, Medusa-type character, this Gorgon character on this Blood Rack Shrine. People really responded well to that. A lot of them got into the painting competitions. Let's do something with that. So they took that aspect, and they turned that into the Malusi Blood Sisters and the Blood Stalkers. They went, all right, that's pretty cool. Well, what else can we do? Well, in 40k, we have sort of these bat-winged creatures, and the Dark Elves used to have harpies. Maybe we can take, like, some of those things, like the, the Dark Eldar bat-winged scourges and the harpies in fantasy, and sort of combine those aspects together so we have these really neat uh, heart renders and life takers. Now, again, the Blood Sisters, Blood Stalkers, it's one kit, two different builds. And the Heart Renders and Life Takers, one kit, two different builds. So that leaves one, two, three, four, five. Five different kits for this army, sold as ten different kits. So it's only half the amount of variety there as you really think with kits. Again, least work, most profit. And they translated that across to Marathi. Now with Marathi, I think it just came down to they had a couple of different competing designs. Said, oh, fuck it, we'll use both because they couldn't make their mind up. And that sort of thing does happen. There's plenty of times, um, like in the Horus Heresy Forge World, I believe the original Sigismund sculpt ended up becoming the uh, Imperial Fist champion model for 30k, or it comes in the, like, the little Command Squad blister. Because they went, no, uh, he's not really up to par, but we, we don't want to throw the model, you know, the model's fine. So that's what it became. Well, same sort of thing here. Um, when you've got the Adonith Deepkin, they're probably the most fleshed out of all of these ranges, because the Adonith Deepkin actually have multiple units. Yes, alright, some, like these Akalian Guard, um, they're the same kit. But the Alapex is its own thing, the Leviadon's its own thing, um, the Thralls and the Reavers are their own entities. But in the case of the Adonith Deepkin, they actually introduce a new thing, which is terrain themed to the faction. In this case, the Aetheric Vortex Gloomtide Shipwreck. What a fancy name. And, of course, you have characters, 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 something I haven't touched off on yet with these comparisons. So, 
Deepkin has less than some factions, and they've got the Tidecaster, Soul Scryer, Soul Render, Akalian King, Batar, Warden of the Souls, Volaternos, Eidolon in both his aspects. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight different characters. Which goes well with the one, two, three, four, five different units available to them. One of those units being a double unit. So they've got more characters than they do units. The theory here being that, hey, Eidolon of Mathlan, one single model that a lot of people want to put in their army. Well, he costs the same as more than two squads of Namadi Thralls, and that's ten models. Well, it's just easier to sell one of Eidolon. It's less work for the guy at Games Workshop, isn't it? One model sold for the price of 20! It's a problem that's as old as Games Workshop itself, selling characters for ridiculous amounts, but it's only got worse in recent years. Now, the reason though I point out that all these different characters is that this is a trend we see. Same thing with the Caradon Overlords. We get Brock Grungson, the Aether Chemist, Etheric Navigator, Arcanaut Admiral, and the Endron Master. When we go over to the Fire Slayers, we get three different characters on Magma Droths, the Rune Father, the Rune Smiter, and the Rune Son. And we also get a Battlesmith, the Be Grimrath Berserker, and the Auric Rune Master. So we're taking a whole bunch of characters and we're fleshing out our factions mostly with those. So straight away, what are we learning? If a faction's going to get bored out, it's either going to be A, something you know already that exists, but all of the things that make it unique are going to get dialed up to 11. So it's going to be incredibly bluntly obvious what the deal is with it. The second thing we notice is that you're going to get very few kits, especially unique kits. Mostly what you're going to get, as in the case of Fire Slayers here, is probably three, three guaranteed separate box sets. And two or three of those are also going to have another build option in them that allows them to be built as either like a ranged unit or a close combat unit, you know, some sort of double up in their options. So let's see if this plays out. We have Fire Slayers, Volkite Berserkers. There's two different infantry kits. Then we've got the Hearthguard and both Hearthguard uh, Berserkers and the Auric Hearthguard. And there are two options in one box kit. So we've confirmed our sort of theory here. Let's try it on the Caradon Overlords. We have the Arcanaut Company. That's a unit. The Grunstock Thunders. That's a unit. The Skywarns and Engine Riggers. Ah, duplicate unit. We've played out our rule again. All right, what about the Deepkin? Well, we've already got a duplicate unit with the Akalian Morsar Guard and the Ishalene Guard. We didn't get the Alapex and the Leviadon as unique sort of units, but they're comparable to the uh, Arcanaut Ironclad Frigate Gun Hauler, that sort of thing. We get the Namadi Thralls and the Namadi Reavers. So essentially, we got three infantry units. And one of those three has a dual build option. Alright, let's try the Daughters of Cain. Now, Daughters of the Cain, to be fair, is a mostly. The, half the army's old stuff. But we have the Witch Elves, Sisters of Slaughter, the Doomfire Warlocks. We've also got the Heart Renderers, the Life Takers, the Blood Sisters, and the Blood Stalkers. And, well, all of the new kits, the Heart Renders and the Blood Stalkers, are both dual kits. From our existing ones, well, I believe the Doomfire Warlocks are also Dark Riders. Adding. If, I, if I'm remembering correctly. So they're a dual kit, but for another sub-faction. And the Sisters of Slaughter and Witch Elves are a dual kit. So this whole faction's full of dual kits. And, of course, we got Marathi. And we've got three different versions of the Cauldron of Blood, which have different characters, which again meets up with what we've covered in the past. So, can we apply these same principles to... The Gloomspire gets. Oh, let's see. 
Skagrot the Loon King. Okay. Gobba Palooza. Well, this Gobba Palooza seems to have many of the different characters all rolled into one box. Probably because they're so small, Games Workshop didn't feel it was worth selling them as individual blisters. So I think it's probably well worth the money, dare I say. Because you're getting basically five characters, tiny characters, mind you. I mean, those are 25 mil bases. So very tiny characters. But you're getting five of them for 84. That's a pretty good price next to Skagrot the Loon King for 55. They bought our new squad of fanatics. Okay. Do they have another build? Don't think so. Uh, Mango Squigs. Mm -hmm. uh, Trogoth and the Dankhold Trogoth. So they've bought our new trolls, new troll character, and these Mango Squigs. They've also got their own custom piece of terrain, which again is a new sort of concept. There's the Squig Herd and the Squig Hoppers. I'll be interested to see. Um, so this faction seems to be a lot more unique than what they've done previously. They've brought over some older units, namely the Arachnarak and the Grot Spider Raiders, and the Scuffle Boss on Gigantic Spider. The old night goblins as shooters and stabbers. Hmm. Unlike the other ones, these guys are so small, you seem to be getting different quantities in the boxes. But the rules holding up, there's a lot of characters. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six right there on screen. Seven. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen different characters. Nowhere near that many body units. Alright, so high character count, yes. Reusing old kits, yes. Some of those old kits have multiple builds. Uh, I'm talking about these stabbers and shooters. Yes. Alright. Grot Riders, another old kit. What aspects have they taken from the existing goblins? Um, I would say they've taken mushrooms, squigs, and spiders. I'm going to say those are the three big defining things about these guys. So, let's example. Let's see what we've got. Fungoid, Cave Shaman, Snazgar, Stink Mullet. Okay, terrible, terrible name right there. Copyright friendly name, of course. Let's have a look at this guy. He is absolutely covered in mushrooms. So, mushrooms, definitely a key theme here. Uh, in the old fluff, goblins used to, of course, eat mushrooms, and they are a type of fungus, being goblins, but more than anything, the idea was things like uh, fanatics would eat the madcap mushrooms and go insane and be immune to pain and all that sort of stuff, and it would probably eventually kill them because they'd overdose on magic mushies. In this case, that's become like the theme behind the army. So, where you had the fire slayers previously, where eh, they're, they're just slayers dialed up to 11, well, this is night goblins dialed up to 11. This boy doesn't have the spider, but he does have like a big giant centipede running down his back. Also, he has barnacles for some reason, which is strange. So, I think barnacles are something we might see popping up again, because I think they're sort of trying to allude to just growths in general, as much as fungus and parasite. Skagrot the Loon King. That's a name I actually kind of like. That's nowhere near as Sigmari. Can't say I like the two long-nosed squigs towing in the cloak behind him, but the rest of the model looks great. Alright. Mushrooms, yep, yeah, all over his head and growing out of his staff. Is a goblin covered in mushrooms essentially the same as a mushroom on a mushroom? Hmm. These are the real questions in life. But no spiders. Now remember, 
spiders are one of the key things I expected to see. We've got the squigs, we've got the mushrooms, we don't have the spiders. Gobapalooza. That's a mushroom spider right in the middle. So I'm going to call that a spider con confirmed. Um, is there anyone here who doesn't have a mushroom? Alright, that guy is high as a kite of mushrooms. He's having a bad trip, bad come down. Uh, even the, the moon on his staff for some reason is frothing at the mouth. That seems like an odd design choice for whoever sculpted that. Um, I, I, I like this model a lot. He just looks so terrified after eating that mushroom. What about this guy? Does he have any mushrooms? No. Although he looks like that may be a mushroom as opposed to a rock he's standing on. It's a bit weird looking. Why does the rock at his feet have a face? That's just odd. So, obviously, I've not actually looked over the range, guys. So, I'm viewing these models the same time you are. Which is why I'm sort of having to explore them a bit. What about this guy? He's a bit of a fat goblin. He's been eating... I don't know how you get fat when you eat mushrooms. Mushrooms are like you take more energy to eat a mushroom than you gain from a mushroom. His head must be really hot if he's boiling a cauldron above his head. <laughs> uh, yeah, but he's got the mushroom theme going on. Uh, no spiders, but he does have some bat's wings and a frog. Some sort of like little gargoyle on the base. Alright, what about this guy? doing some sort of tribal dance looks like mad cat goblin new year I mean, if there's the mushrooms oh it's a squig skeleton that he's inside so squigs have skeletons there you go oh this is one freaky dude this is probably what that really scared goblin the one Sitting on top of the mushroom who's got the wolf of terror. This is probably what he's seeing. Other goblins look like. No wonder he's scared. Uh, that's a scorpion stinger as opposed to a spider stinger. But they're both arachnids, okay? Just let me have this. Um, and lots of mushrooms. And he's got a sort of arachnid or insectoid look because he has all these extra arms. And yes, they are spider arms. This is a spidery boy. He has a lot of extra eyes, which is extra creepy. Yeah, it works. Alright. So, mushrooms confirmed. Spiders, not very common at all. Um, squigs, yeah, they were very common here. Alright, next, the Trogoth. Well, I think this one's going to be confirmed for mushrooms straight away. Uh, he also has the barnacles really going on. Doesn't have the squigs though, doesn't have the spiders. The barnacles, yeah, it's an interesting design choice. I think they first did it on the deep kin. Um, it's something I would have liked to have seen more on the Plague Marines in 40k. Uh, instead of what they did do with those, which was a lot of tentacle porn. Not really my thing. So, yeah, barnacles make sense if it's like some sort of river goblin. I mean, you have to be going underwater for a very long time, being very, very still for barnacles to grow on you. Uh, he's got a giant centipede there. Hey, we got we got a spider alert. We've got a spider alert on his stalactite or stalactite. Don't know if he pulled it from the ceiling or the ground. He has a spider coming down. So, spiders confirmed. Alright. Fanatics. Ah, fanatics. Why do these guys get new models? To give you an idea, this is the old models for the fanatics. And these were plastic. Uh, before this was white metal. There is nothing wrong with these models. I've got three. They've actually got really good crisp details. Um, I'm guessing they just didn't fit into the new theme, which is harsh, hard, sharp angles. Like, I've never seen hats which look like jointed insect legs before. And I don't think that was intentional. I think it was just done so it's easier for the artist to highlight them. 
that's the sort of prevailing theory with Games Workshop's digital sculpting is they're putting a lot of hard edges and sharp lines deliberately on their models to aid with the artist's painting. So, yeah, okay, Fanatics, they've been... Before, they were just swinging a ball and chain. Now, they're spiky balls on chains, and they have mushrooms, and they doled them up another, like, 10, 15% more fanatical. I like them. It just seems a little bit pointless. There was nothing wrong with what they had. Of course, the guy ODing down the bottom there, that's pretty cool. Probably not for him. Spewing out a lot of mushroom. Oh, no wonder you're ODing. And, hmm. Alright. Last one we'll look at. Sneaky Snufflers. So, spider backpacks. Check. We've got our spider theme. Uh, fungus, yes, they've definitely got fucking mushrooms all over them. And squigs, they have pig squigs. So squigs are now starting to come in all different varieties. There's squigs with noses. There was, of course, the squig skeleton. And there's these tiny little mini squigs and dead squigs on their bases. And now we've got pig squigs. I don't know how you evolve that, but it's a thing. Uh, and of course, yeah, dead spiders as backpacks. Huh. Think you'd defang the spiders, wouldn't you? I mean, you don't want to tilt your head back and accidentally impale yourself and get venomed. Eh, yeah, what would I know? Yeah, overall, I like the gloom spike gets, I guess, as a range. Um, predictions wise, so. I can't tell you what faction they're going to cover off on next. Common sense would dictate it would have to be some sort of humanoid faction, or should, more specifically, an actual human faction. Maybe a reimagining of the Empire or Britonia would be great to see. Uh, or probably Chaos, because Chaos hasn't really been touched in Age of Sigma much yet, so maybe some sort of Slaneshi release would be interesting to see. Uh, what would that mean? That would mean five to six new characters. Or at least five to six characters. So if they're going to do like free men or something, free peoples, I don't know what they're currently called in Age of Sigma, but men in general. I would imagine a few different new named characters will probably get bought out. Uh, they have again that two choices aspect. They go with sort of existing themes. Do you try and you know, take something like uh, the German aspects, for example, of an Imperial Army, and try and dial that up to 11, and make everyone, like, the most minuscule dudes look like Wanschnecht or something. No, probably not. So I think they'd try and take some other element and, and move with that. So I would imagine, especially having seen Carrot on Overlord still to extent, perhaps Empire Steampunk Forces. With like walking steam tanks and they would have cavalry of course but they might be robotic cavalry hmm there'd be a lot of steam powered stuff in there uh, less gunpowder looking weapons and more like crazy steam stuff like steam flamethrowers and because that's a really minor aspect of the Empire that I would not put it past games workshop to play up to 11 uh, what would they call these forces hmm well, there's the question. So, something that sounds similar to what they are now. What are our precedents? We've got Fire Slayers. Caron Overlord's completely different. We need to look at similar to existing. Alright. Daughters of Cain is similar to existing. So, they took the god Cain. They just took an aspect. Alright. Gloom Spite Gits. Well, they're always being Gits. What would the Empire name? For a new Empire steampunky faction. Engine Guild. Something like that. But it couldn't be spelt engine. It'd be like Engine Guild. E-N-G-Y-N-E -E Guild. Something like that. Engine Guild would be the faction. And they'll be steampunky humans. And they'll have robot cavalry and like a robotic steam tank. And there'll be lots of brass colours in there. 
a uh, little bit of timber around as well you know don't want it to go fully brass the infantry would be armed with some sort of steampunky weapons like gigantic weird looking blunderbusses maybe even gas masks yeah they might even go gas masks so that would be my predictions for one crazy way they could go right sounds stupid now until they do it right nobody thought that there'd be elves riding turtles in the battle did they yes that's right flying turtles that bring the ocean with them apparently um yeah that would be one thing i could definitely see so that's my sort of prediction for upcoming factions they'll either take that tiny little aspect and dial it up to 11 or they'll take like themes and dial those up to 11 so the Caradon Overlords, it's, you know, themes of honor and uh, technology and a love of gold. But it can't just be gold, it has to be space gold for copyright. With the Daughters of Cain, though, they're the opposite again. They took an existing subunit in a faction or a sub-faction and they fleshed it out to its whole own entity. Same with the Fire Slayers. So that's the way it'll either go. And you can do that for every faction. They could take something like Bretonia and go for a very knight-themed army if they ever brought them back out. More now, people are going, oh, they already were knight-themed. No, I mean like gigantic steeds, like similar to demigriffs or to um, Archaeons, those three knights that ride around with him, his sort of bodyguard guys, something like that, you know making them a lot smaller more elite very small cavalry army as opposed to you know those big blocks of like 15 knights you used to see there'll be none of that no no no, not in not in this game not in age of sigma you will not see big armies and things like bretonia um they could play up things like the fey enchantress angle and have like enchantresses of the wood or something like that um that's just the overwhelming way that they seem to go uh tomb kings Maybe they'll follow something like Hollywood and go for like a Scorpion King style. Um, as opposed to being outright mummies, they could be like half mummified or even alive. New forms given flesh or perhaps wearing suits made of gold. You know, there's all these weird different ways that these factions could be done and brought back in. If you don't think there's a bunch of different ways something can be done, look at what they did with the undead recently. And taking just wraiths and banshees to relatively minor units in the scheme of things and turning them into their whole own faction so don't doubt that they could do things like my crazy steampunk empire thing because that's the way they operate now uh maximum copyright just keep that in mind maximum copyright it's gotta have a dumb name can't be an inspired name it has to be a dumb name which is why i picked engine guild or engine guild because again we've got to pronounce that why for copyright I could just imagine it now, you know, your Duncan Rhodes, your two thin coats of paint. Here we're going to build some engine guild today. Actually, I think that's more cocky. Oh well, it's terrible in any case. Anyway, back with the outer circle. There's my thoughts on Gloom Spike Gits. Obviously, the episode was mostly about what Games Workshop's doing. But that's because that's interesting. Whereas me looking at the Gloom Spike Gits probably wasn't that interesting. Anyway. Uh, oh, one last little thought. I don't know if anyone here plays Pokemon, but I used to play it a lot when I was a kid, so it came out when I was like 9 years old, uh, 10 years old, something like that, late 90s, and there is a Pokemon called Gloom, it evolves from Oddish and turns into Vileplume, I'm going to say, that sounds right, massive flower on her head, now Gloom is kind of like these goblins the gloom spike gets she has stuff growing out of her head just a random thought see you all next time